Thank you for listening to Issues Etc. And thanks to all of you who have chipped in to help support the show. Listener contributions are the reason we can do this. So thanks. Greetings and welcome to Issues Etc. I'm Todd Wilkin. Thanks for tuning us in. Why do you go to church? You know, I've asked that question uh, in the course of some airtime before, and I had such a variety of answers. Some of them sounded marvelous. I go for the fellowship. I go because I need to be with other Christians. I go because I need to have my gas tank filled. I run dry by the end of a long, hectic work week, and I need that gas tank filled or my battery recharged. And when I leave, I leave strong and invigorated and feeling like I can tackle yet another seven days of work until Sunday rolls around again. Why do you go to church? It's a much more involved question than it sounds like. We'll be talking about it in the course of this hour with Dr. Norman Nagel. Why go to church? Dr. Norman Nagel is professor of systematic theology at Concordia Seminary here in St. Louis. Dr. Nagel, welcome back. No, glad to be here. Dr. Nagel, why do you go to church? (laughs) I wonder when you ask that question what you are setting me up for that tempts me to talk about myself and uh, anything I could say about myself isn't going to be finally very convincing for anybody. Trouble often is when you ask people about the church, they either begin talking about themselves or uh, talking about the pastor, uh, what's good or bad about him, or about the people. Uh, they can be very nice or they can be not as friendly as they are. As if the, and these things tend to, to crowd into the front and, and block out what's really the heart of the matter. Uh, If you ask the wrong question, you'll never get the right answer. And the only good answers are the ones that the Lord gives us. So, why would the Lord have us go to church? If we put it to him and hear it from him, then we might get something that's really solid and persuasive. So, when I ask the question, why do you go to church? The question puts the emphasis on me and not on what the Lord is doing. Exactly. So, you start with the Lord. And he's at the center of it all, and everything sort of grows or moves out from there. If we start at the periphery, then we can get bogged down with all kinds of things that bother us, uh, that he's the Lord to help us through. And unless we start with him... We'll never get there. And he's the one who, well, the whole thing is that at church we go to hear the words of the Lord. When the Lord is, speaks to us in the Scriptures, we're there to hear them. And to hear them in the way in which he has put us all together as his people, not just the, the bits that I like, but how it's all shared together in the company of the believers. The words go into each one of us, and it's his words, and he does his words. They say what they say, they do what they say, and what's best with gospel words, they deliver the gifts that they say. And if you're not there, uh, then you're not the receiving end of the words that Deliver the gifts that are of your salvation for you. Tell us about those gifts, then. Well, church is for sinners only. You may have... uh, If you don't have any sins, uh, don't bother with Jesus. Uh, He is... That's his name. He shall be called Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And that's what you hear only at church. When you come out of church, you should say, you know, you can't hear that any place else. This is the straight stuff we're getting it from the Lord Jesus. And he's the one 
who cared so much about us that he was willing to take all our sins upon himself and answer for them. Calvary, he's done it. And now, after he'd done it all, he saw to it that the gifts would be delivered. And it's, we, it's at church where those get, gifts get delivered, given out, week by week. Now, those gifts again, uh, now they're centered, they're for sinners only. Jesus gives them, and we can only get them at church. What are they? Well, they are what his words tell us. One of the prayers we pray, beginning of church, is, Lord, open thou my heart to hear, and through thy words to me draw near. It's through his words that he gets to us, deals with us, delivers his gifts. And these words (laughs) are what create faith and nourish faith. As it says in Romans, that faith is born, is created by what is heard, by what goes in the ear hole. It's from outside that it comes, and that's the way that gifts come. You can't crank up any gifts inside yourself. They come in in the way that he has arranged to deliver them to you through his words, and then his words that are tied up with the water in holy baptism. And there are his words that are tied up with the bread and wine that give us his body and blood. And then there are the words that deliver us, deliver to us our, the forgiveness of sins in the absolution. And when we hear those words, we are at the receiving end of the Lord's words. The minister is just there as the Lord's instrument for speaking those words. The Lord has use of his mouth for the Lord saying his words to us. And when it's all his words, then those are about the only words we can have final and ultimate confidence in. Anybody else's words aren't quite so what you can stake your life on as only the words of the Lord when he speaks to you through the Scriptures. Take the Bible out of church, and what's the point of going? Well, someone says, I will take my Bible out of church, and I'll, t- I'll take it with me at home, and I'll have church at home, because I can hear the word of the Lord at home. I can open my Bible and read it. That is in contradiction of the way the Lord has himself a people. He gathers us together, and it's in he puts the gifts into each one of us, And we can't possibly say, oh, isn't that nice? I'll just hug myself and feel how good it is to be loved so much by Jesus. The gifts that he puts into you are the same as the gifts he puts into somebody else. And those gifts work, pull us together and enliven and energize and stimulate one another to live out the life that is there for us in the gifts that he gives us. And so... The way of gifts is the way of sharing. If you think you're just going to keep the gifts to yourself, they perish. His gifts only live as they are lived on, and they are shared, and they embrace us together as they have their way with us. And so when we talk about church, we are delivered out of this sort of selfish preoccupation, me and Jesus. Jesus does all that he does for you, gives you all that he gives to you, for you, to enliven you into his body. And you know how the body is spoken of in the Corinthians and other places in the New Testament where we're all members of the body and no part of the body can say to another, I don't need you. I'm quite happy by myself. An arm or an eye can't live just by itself, unto itself, but it's as it is built together into the body that the whole body fitted together, as it says, can grow and rejoice together. And so it's in being there for one another, prompted by the Lord's gifts that he puts into each one of us that make us one body in him. So when someone says, this is why I go to church, it's very important to know what they mean by church. 
Right, and it's also better. <laughs> that only holds if the answer is a Jesus answer. If they're, talk, if they're talking about themselves, <laughs> uh, there's not much. That's another thing that's in First Corinthians. There are lots of things messing the church up in Corinth, and the way the apostle helps to deliver them, hopes to deliver them out of that, is to ask, how how does that tie in with Jesus? That whole business about the gifts. Are the gifts that you are received, claimed to be getting, are they making you just talk about yourself and puff yourself up? Or do those gifts have their way in you as gifts from Jesus so that you come out with Jesus' talk and not uh, talking about yourself? Jesus isn't my Savior by the nice things that I can say about him. Jesus is my Savior because he took all my sins, answered for them on the cross. It is finished. And now, with his words, through the Bible, through baptism, through the Lord's Supper, through absolution, all of those gifts are delivered to us Sunday by Sunday, and we rejoice to be receiving them together. When we come back from this break... Someone says, but I go to church to learn about Jesus. I go to church to hear about Jesus. It sounds to me, from my guest, Dr. Norman Nagel, that there's a lot more than just about Jesus at church. Maybe we might be talking about Jesus himself when we talk about the church. You know that we love our on-demand listeners, and that's why we've produced this Issues Etc. Classic. Now, if you appreciate this special broadcast, please consider making a tax-deductible gift to support the worldwide outreach of Issues Etc. You can make a secure online donation at issuesetc.org. You can also make a donation by check. Make your check payable to Lutheran Public Radio and send it to LPR, Box 912, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. Thanks for listening, and thanks for your support. We're answering the question, why go to church? Our guest, Dr. Norman Nagel, professor of systematic theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Dr. Nagel, someone says, I go to church to learn about Jesus. I go to church to hear about Jesus. How do you respond to that question? That sort of pushes him off a wee bit. It's safer to be talking about him than for him to be talking to you. It's with the Lord that you have to deal And you mayn't turn him into some ideas or notions or emotions uh, so that you feel a bit safer if you're just talking about Jesus. But to be at the receiving end of the words of the Lord is to be brought under judgment and to the repentant sinner, the forgiveness of sins. That's the only Jesus that's going My Jesus, your Jesus, I got a better Jesus than your Jesus. There isn't any other Jesus than the one who speaks to us through the Scriptures, who deals with us in delivering the forgiveness of sins. It is the Lord who puts his name upon us with the water of holy baptism. It is the Lord who puts into our mouths his body and blood. It is with the Lord that you have to deal. It's facing up to the Lord that we have to have the courage for to go to church. We've got so many ways of sort of protecting ourselves against the Lord and his getting in too close. But we go to church so that he would get in close and we be at the receiving end of the words that are spoken to us as his words and we at the receiving end of them receive what they give. And there's no point in making up any other kind of Jesus. Any other Jesus that you make up is no, you can only keep such a Jesus going as long as you keep him going. The only Jesus that does the full Lord job is the one whose birth we soon will be celebrating and who went all the way to Calvary carrying our sins that we might not come under their punishment, that separation from God, 
that he went through, forsaken, so that we might be spared of that. And he then, all that he did, given to us. But it's not given to us just by our thinking about it, and isn't that a lovely idea? It's that he gives it to us as he delivers his gift through his words, through the water and his words and the name and his body and blood. That's why we go to church, where we aren't in control, we aren't calling the shots. He is the Lord, and we are there at the receiving end of such a Lord who loved us so much as to win salvation for us, but not only to win it, but to see to it that we received it, that we were at the receiving end of his giving out of his gifts. And for that, he pulls us all together, and by his gifts, he knits us together in the receiving of his gifts and in the living out of them together. So the person who says, I go to hear about Jesus, kind of holding Jesus at arm's length, Mm -hmm. might leave church saying, well, that was rather unremarkable. I didn't hear anything new about Jesus this week. I might as well have stayed home. Correct? The very notion that one could have received all that's Jesus for us is an utter nonsense. The glory of the gospel is that he gives us everything. When he forgives us our sins, he forgives the whole lot. And yet he's always giving us more and more. And so (laughs) going to church is also being among those who can confess, give witness of what Jesus is doing in their lives. He has a unique way with each one of us, but all of us together are those whom he has knit together as his body. And that life of his body is something that we we never exhaust together. As it says in the large catechism, there's enough in baptism for us to learn and to live out our whole lives long, to live as those whom the Lord has baptized, and not only me, but you, and so together does. You said Jesus has a, a unique way with each of us, or he deals with us uniquely, each one of us, and yet it's the same Jesus? It's the same gifts? It's the same forgiveness of sins? Right. But (laughs) he loves us each in a way that is unique to each one of us. The the sins that are yours that he forgives, there's only one lot like that. And the forgiveness with which he wipes those sins away and makes you alive as his child and strengthens you to live out his gifts. These are unique to each one of us. You know, sometimes you see a picture of the angels in heaven and they've all got the same faces, like cookie-cutter faces. But in heaven, each one is a different one. The Lord loves us What he would bring to completion out of each one of us is something quite unique. There'll only be one, just like you, that he, the Lord would have brought through to completion to all the beauty and fulfillment that he has in mind when he died for you, when he made you his own with baptism, and when he keeps you all the way to the final completion of his gifts that we shall rejoice in in heaven. And when we are told, we're not told terribly much about heaven, but one thing about heaven that we are surely told is that we're all in it together. There's nobody sitting in a corner just having a happy time all by himself. The happy times in the Lord's love are rejoicing times which is always increased in the back and forth of our doing it together as his gifts are enlivened in each one of us, toward each one of us. This is a much broader, broader subject than one could deal with in, in the course of an hour. But again, it's also a very simple subject, isn't it? When we ask the question, why go to church? The answer has to center in the person of Jesus and what he does. Otherwise, we're just talking about ourselves. Otherwise, we're just talking about our personal preferences for why we show up at a particular locale, at a particular address, 
on Sunday morning. I like the pastor. I like the people. The people, they're just like me. They think like me. But you know there are other answers that people give to that question, why do you go to church? Perhaps the first and foremost is, I go to church because Jesus commands me to go. For me, this is an issue of obedience to Jesus' command. When we come back from the break, we're going to talk about that one. Folks, the gospel is free, but producing this show isn't. Please consider making a donation to Issues Etc. today. One of the possible answers to that question, I think, is probably one of the more popular answers, Dr. Nagel, is, for me, it's a matter of obedience. Christ commands, therefore I obey. I go in response to Christ's command. Perhaps better than saying commands would be to say, he invites us. Command is a word we have to look at very carefully. It can carry the weight of sort of the, the, the sergeant major or carry a, a burden of, of compulsion or coercion into it. You'd better do it or I'll clobber you, a kind of command. Command in that way is a heavy uh, sort of compelling, coercive kind of a word. And so it's in that sense, it's contrary to the gospel. For Jesus, as the one who gives gifts, suffers his gifts to be rejected. Nobody, he doesn't get anybody in because he whips them in or puts a gun in their ribs. He invites them. Here are the gifts that I am most eager to give you. And if we receive those words of his as an invitation and understand commandment then as his bidding, his invitation, his gracious words that draw us to where he would be giving out his gifts, then it's no longer uh, the compelling word that the word command uh, is nowadays. So much command, obedience, it, it sounds a bit uh, too, too, too military, and that's no way the Lord has himself, his people, and his family. He has them only in the way of gifts. But if, if you refuse his gifts, then that refusal turns them into law. And gift refused becomes curse. As you had in in, in 1 Corinthians again, when they were denying the body and blood of Christ, that was then, some are sick, some are weak, and some have died. When gift is refused, then it becomes the law, the curse, the punishment, and of that there is no refusal. So when he deals with you in the gospel, he deals with you in a way of his giving out his gifts, and there he suffers himself to be rejected. Think of Calvary. But his gifts refused, then turn to judgment. And so it's vital when we think of saying he commands us to come, uh, that's true when we hear those words as gospel words and not as putting a whip to our backs and that if we don't go, well, that'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cop it or he'll, we'll be sure to get punishment. We don't go to church uh, because the, uh, he'll be angry with us if we don't. He'll be disappointed if he can't be giving out his gifts. That's what he loves to do most of all. But if you won't be dealt with in that way of his gifts, then you'll get the other way, the way that you deserve, and that is judgment. We give our kids little gold stars or pins for perfect attendance at church. Sometimes we give them a certificate. Um, Sometimes it even extends to the adults. Adults get perfect attendance awards for being at church every Sunday, 52 Sundays a year. What's that about? I suppose one has to look at that again rather carefully. If <laughs> if that is something that we are using 
to congratulate ourselves, uh, to make ourselves big, or to suggest that we are better Christians than other people, then it's the sort of thing that the apostle was battling against in the church in Corinth. If it's a way of, of giving thanks for gifts, then that's a jolly good thing. And bringing in children, I suppose, uh, one needs then also to to recognize uh, the role of, of, of discipline in the way we, we rear our children and in the way in which we also live our lives in a pattern, in a discipline that is shaped by the fact that we belong to the Lord as his forgiven, baptized, energized people. And so on Sunday morning, we don't ask uh, do I feel like going to church today? That's as silly as saying, well, do you think we should have any meals today? We just take it for granted that we may are going to have uh, some dinner. <laughs> and dinner may be just the same old meat and potatoes, but we don't say, oh, I won't bother about dinner because it's just the same old meat and potatoes. Uh, we just do it in the rhythm of our day. We have the meals that we do. And in the rhythm of our lives, Sunday is the day when the Lord would give out his gifts and, and feed us. And the food comes with his words that go into our ear holes. Faith is born of what is heard. And into our mouths, his body and blood, enlivening us, forgiving us, knitting us together as those who are his. So it's a heart, it's question of, where well, we would say, the distinction between law and gospel. The Lord wants to deal with us the gospel way. That's the way he loves to do it. But if you reject him, if you refuse to be given to, if you say, I'll call the shots, and this is what I figure is the way it should be, and I'll take what I think it ought to be, then <laughs> that's what you'll get, and not uh, be able uh, to dodge it. The judgment of God upon those who reject his gifts cannot be, cannot be evaded, and that is the dread thing of facing up to the fact that the Lord has two ways of dealing with us, in the way of the gospel and in the way of the law. And if we, if we reject his gospel way, then we'll get the law way. Or as somebody said, if you ask the Lord to give you what you deserve and think you merit, uh, be careful, that's what you'll get. After seven uh, long days of working out there in the world, I'm worn out, my spirit is tired, I need motivation for the next seven days. I need my batteries recharged or my gas tank refilled. Is that a reason to go to church? Well, I think that's not a bad reason. It's a rather uh, odd way of, of putting it. Uh, as if uh, y you... <laughs> you like. You need some more use of the Lord, and so you'll have a bit more uh, of him uh, to carry you through. He is not there uh, at our disposal. You, the Lord doesn't belong to you. You belong to him, and he's eager to give you the resources for living out each one of your days, one week after another week. And so that's why we're at church, to be receiving those gifts. And you can talk about that, about as, as charging up your batteries or something like that. But better you talk about the words that he's putting into your ear hole and what he's putting into your mouth and all that you are receiving there and that you are then resourced to live the week ahead as one that belongs to him. And that's terribly important for everything around us in the world is tempting us to live as if we belong to ourselves, to ask the question, what do I get out of it? That is the peril of sin when we are enclosed, imprisoned in our own preoccupation with ourselves. We were created to belong together. And it is only as we are knit together and receiving from his hands the gifts that enable us thus to live 
that he carries us through. So, <laughs> the Lord never comes at point number two. I think I could use some more Lord. <laughs> no, uh, we can't treat him so uh, as if he, uh, as if as if we could whistle him up whenever we wanted a bit more of him. How dare we imagine that the Lord God has to sit up and pay attention uh, when we call on him and say, now this is what I want. He knows better than we do what we want. And faith is the hands that are open, eager to receive what's from him as nothing but gift. Someone says, well, I think I've caught on to the emphasis of the forgiveness of sins. And so I'm looking at it this way, Dr. Nagel. Um... And we'll have to answer this after the break. Um, I commit a certain number of sins throughout my my work week. And and when I get to Sunday, I have a burden of sin that I carry to church there. And I need forgiveness for those sins. So I can start the week over with a clean slate. Because a lot is built up during this week. When we come back from the break, is that why we ought to go to church? Because we've committed, we've got our parcel of sins that we carry in. And we'll get those taken care of, and we'll leave with a clean slate for the next week. And they'll build up again, but we'll come back for the requisite amount of forgiveness that we need. Like what you hear? Please support this worldwide outreach with a tax-deductible contribution today. Uh, Dr. Nagel, before the break, I asked, uh, you know, I sin a little, and so I need Sunday morning for a little bit of forgiveness, or I sin a lot, and I need Sunday morning for a lot of forgiveness. Your response? Well, that's to let sin be determinative of the sort of Savior that we have, and it has the fault of quantifying our sins as if, you know, I've got 27 sins this week, and, and well, last week I had 107, and that's the determining size of the forgiveness. The forgiveness that Jesus gives isn't determined by the size of our sins, nor are our sins to be what overshadows our lives. We can face up to our sins honestly when we are praying, when we are before the Lord. We don't have to play games with him and sort of measure up our sins and say, well, I'm doing a bit better or a bit worse this week than I last week. When we come together, the confession of sins is an utterly complete one. All my sins, all my sins. What The only sins that condemn you are the sins that you hold outside of Christ's forgiveness. And so the glory of confessing our sins so completely and doing it before God and his word and receiving from him then by his word the forgiveness of sins, then we are free of them. And it's not as though, well, now sin's going to be what's running my life again. What's running my life now is that I'm a forgiven sinner, and I live in the freedom that he gives me as his forgiven child. One Christian put it very profoundly when he wouldn't when he recognized that the measure of sins that we calculate is then the calculated measure of his forgiveness. He said he forgives us more sins than we got. Now that's gospel. Someone might say, I go to church to have fellowship with like minded Christians. How would you respond? Oh, a lot of these things that you are putting to me are good in themselves when they are connected up with Jesus. But if you sort of disconnect them from him, as we talked earlier about talking about Jesus and being a church being at sort of one or two removes from where the Lord is at and running the show, we talk about the liturgy as the divine service. That's the Lord's doing. He's running his words, and his words are the only ones we can finally rely on. And that's why we are there, to live in that confidence of being dealt with by the Lord. And as he gives us his gifts, I'm not the only forgiven sinner there. There's, there are, there's my family, and there's are those that I may have sinned against, or they sinned against me. We are there together before the Lord. It is before him. It is with the Lord that you have to deal, not with the pastor or the people or your ideas about Jesus or how he ought to run his being the Lord. You just simply face up to him 
and hear him diagnose you with his law, a sinner. And as repentant sinner, he forgives you not just the measure of your sins, but as it says in the small catechism, where there is forgiveness of sins, there there is also life and salvation. And that's the joy of the Christian life. We don't go round groaning under our sins all week. We are going, we have to face them, and we face them up before the Lord. But we live in his forgiveness And in that freedom is the joy of the Christian life. Then no one can bring us into bondage. If our sins can't bring us into bondage, what else can? We are Christ's own free people. For freedom he has made you free, it says. Let's go to the phones. Jennifer's calling from Pittsburgh. WPIT is her station. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. Hi. Um, I was hoping I'd get on. Um, Yeah, I was calling about your question, and your guest has been very articulate and very wonderful to listen to. I appreciate him. Um, The reason I go to church is to worship, because I have found um, that the people there, if I go to socialize, if I go to connect or to meet people or win friends and influence people or whatever, I am often very disappointed. And if I do not go with in mind worshiping God, and, and the word worship, if I understand correctly, means worship, and if I don't go with the intent of showing um, how I value God, how I value Christ, and Him only, I will stop going to church because I have been injured emotionally by the people in church many, many times. Jennifer, and, thank you very much for the call. We got uh, pressing time here, Doctor Nagel. Does God does God need my worship? Well, I, I, the, the best thing that Jennifer said is that it was all so Jesus centered. He's sort of the, the the number one. You are there for His sake, so that you would be listening to His words and receiving His gifts. But the gifts that he gives into you, you just can't keep for yourself. They are alive only as they flow on through you to others. And to those others that are disappointing, they also need to be freed of their sins by the forgiveness that isn't only yours, but theirs as well, so that you would then work and pray that all together. Now, we aren't, we don't go to church because the Christians are the most splendid people in the world. Christians are forgiven sinners, and that we know about ourselves, and we need to, and and about others as well, but the first sins we commit, are we, we confess, are our own, and that forgiveness then enables us to live forgivingly with others. It isn't as though forgiveness is a virtue that we practice. Jesus gives us more forgiveness than we have need of so that there's lots to spare for us to share to the others and that they too might be freed from the ways in which they they hurt and damage people. Dan is calling from Sonoma, California, listening on KFAX. Hi, Dan. Let's make it quick. Operative word, culturally, why do we have a hard time gathering under the umbrella of Christ? All right, thanks a lot, Dan. Um, why under the umbrella of Christ and all the other umbrellas that we construct for why we go to church? There isn't any other Savior than the one who answered for your sins. It's not as though we make a list of prescriptions for how the Lord ought to do his being Lord. He is the Savior that he is. There's only one Calvary in all the world. And only there have your sins been answered for. So you can try the other umbrellas. We call that idolatry. And idols usually tend to come in the plural because one is never enough and you can't be really counted on. So it's good to have a few backup ones. But Jesus doesn't need any backup. Dr. Nagel, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for being with us. Dr. Norman Nagel is professor of systematic theology at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. We've been talking about that question, why 
go to church. You know, you can go just about any place and get fellowship of a kind. Like-minded individuals where you can gather. You go to a, go to a ball game and be a fan of the local sports team. That's like-minded individuals gathering voluntarily. You can go for motivation or to learn something. Or I guess you could even go to fulfill some obligation of obedience. Any place else. Nowhere else is Jesus giving out the benefits of his life and his death and his resurrection than where he gathers his people together around his own word. That word that says what it says and does what it says. When Jesus speaks that word, you are my child, when he puts his name on you, the name of the triune God, that does what it says. When he speaks that word, I forgive you all your sins, it forgives you all your sins. The forgiveness is sufficient and beyond sufficient for what you have done, ever. When he says to you, this is my body given to you for the forgiveness of sins, eat it, then take it and eat it. But you won't find that anyplace else. You won't find that gathering for fellowship or motivation someplace else. Only where Christ gathers us to forgive us all our sins, there in his church. I'm Todd Wilkin. Thanks for listening. If you appreciate this Issues Etc. Classic, please consider making a tax-deductible donation today. You can make a financial contribution by check, make your check payable to Lutheran Public Radio, and send it to LPR, Box 912, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234.